Welcome to Casters and thanks for being here this morning. If you're visiting us for the first time today, we're so glad you're here. We ask that you text the word guest to the number below because we'd love the opportunity to connect with you. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to stop by our welcome center or you can join us right here in the auditorium following either service at our welcome party in the East Alco. You have also received a welcome card. We ask that you fill that out and either hand it in with a volunteer from guest services or you can drop it in a giving box at the back of the room. We'd like to know that you were here and it's a way for us to follow up with you and learn about your experience. We also want you to know that Christmas at Cassis is coming, December 24th at 1, 3 or 5 p.m. So mark your calendars now and we can't wait to see you that evening. If you're available to attend the service and volunteer for another, please visit the main page of our website under current events to see all of the volunteer opportunities. There is a place for everyone at Christmas to either attend or volunteer, so be sure to sign up soon. You are a vital part of making Christmas at Cats a special for everyone that evening. We're so glad you're here today. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we're thankful for you, and we hope you have a wonderful day. Well, good morning, everybody. Will you stand with us? We're going to worship together. We're going to proclaim beautiful things about the character of our God and what he does in us and through us. So let's do that together this morning.
God, we believe that you are a God that keeps your promises. We proclaim that this morning, Lord, that we trust that. We want to live life with you, so we invite you in here to this room right now, God. We invite you to be here with us. We make space for you. We love you, Lord. We want to do this with you. Surround us with your presence this morning, God. surrender 
want to do life with you, Lord. We trust you. We know that you are a God who provides, who loves us, God. And we're so grateful. one room. You guys can go ahead and grab a seat. Hopefully, when you walked in, you grabbed communion elements because we're going to move into a time of communion together. You know, I get asked, I don't know, it seems a couple times a month, uh, almost every month, uh, about communion around here. And it's because a lot of people are maybe from a Catholic background or maybe you're new with church and you're not quite sure why we do this. And I want to take a moment to explain it to you just so that we can all be on the same page and center into this next moment together. Uh, you know, we don't believe that communion is something that saves us. We believe that Jesus did that, has done that, is doing that always, uh, and that that rests with him. We believe that communion is something that's symbolic. It's the symbolic practice that we reflect upon that unites us with one another in Christ. It reminds us of who Christ is in us and through us and around us, and that you are now a part of something so much larger than yourself in terms of being a part of a church, being a part of Christ in you. It's this powerful thing. And we believe that communion is this amazing centering practice. There's a reason why we pause to do this with some regularity. There's something about centering back in on the truth of who Christ is and that he's died for us, that he rises for us, that we're alive in him and that that is what we're centered in in our truth now, isn't it? because you can drift from that. There's something amazing about doing this together, centering back in. So that's the heart of communion and that's why we practice it here. And so I wanna take a moment to pray before we enter into a moment of communion together. Will you bow your heads with me? God, we thank you for Jesus. We do, we thank you for your love and I thank you that you have a relentless kind of love. It doesn't quit, it, it pursues us, Lord. And I just thank you for that. I thank you for each and every person in here that knows just how deeply loved they are by you. I thank you for your son 
and for his blood poured out upon us. I thank you that there's something so powerful like the practice of communion that unites us. So Lord, I pray for each person in this room, if anybody's carrying something heavy, I pray that that be laid at the foot of the cross, Lord. Rest put to rest with Christ, that they might find life in you. God, I pray that if there's anybody in here who feels distant or separated from you, that they would know that there's nothing that your love and your grace cannot overcome and that they would sense your closeness. Make yourself close to them, even now, even here. You already are. And Lord, for each of us, as we go to take this together, unite us as your church, as your body, God, in a powerful way, God, that we might continue to love others the same way that you love us. So we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When the first communion was taken, it was at a Passover meal. We call it the Last Supper. And it was this meal that the Jewish people would eat on re- once a year as part of a larger celebration. And there's this reflection on each moment. And on this particular night when Jesus took a loaf of bread, he said something they'd never heard before. And yet as they ate it, they reflected on the same thing that we're going to reflect on here in just a moment. And it's this. And I want you to take the wafer out. He said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat, friends. And at the same time, the same night, he passed a glass of wine, and they would do this on a regular basis, except this time he said something they'd never heard before, something with new and profound meaning that we've been reflecting on ever since. And he said, this is my blood that is poured out for you. So friends, will you take it and drink? There's a reason we do this together. We do this in remembrance of him.
This week, as we think about what we're thankful for, remember the things that we have seen the Lord do. When I was lost and all alone, your presence was where I found home. You were here and you're here right now. In every high, in every low, You are good and you're good right now. Let's sing it. Come on. I've witnessed your faithfulness. I've seen you bring life with it. So I'll pour up my praise again. You're worthy. God, you're worthy of all of it. Your promise is
witness it. You're constant, I've witnessed it, and I'm confident. I see it again and again. You love and I've witnessed it. You heal and I've witnessed it. You save and I've witnessed it, and I'm confident. I see it again and again. You're good and I witness it. You're strong and I witness it. You're constant, I witness it. And I'm confident. I see it again and again. You love and I witness it. You heal and I witness it. You save. Friends, can you do me a favor? Right now, all of our middle schoolers have been joining us for worship. Can we just welcome them? Because we are their church. We love you guys. All right, and before you sit down, I know some of you are already starting. I want you to turn to one another. We're going to greet one another, and I want you to use the following question. Ready? Is it a sin? Some of you are like, okay. To put Christmas decorations up before Thanksgiving. Go. <laughs> I can hear people yelling, it is a sin. <laughs> that makes me happy. I asked that same question in the last service and somebody said, you don't have to put them up if you never take them down. And I thought, that's... Awful, it makes me sad inside for some reason. Uh, for us, it's actually not too early. So if you're sitting here, raise your hand if you're like, I've already got Christmas stuff up. You're all, you're full tilt. We've got two hands at the booth. Some people are really proud of this. That's amazing. And how many of you guys are like, no, you hold out. You got to wait. Hold back the tides, everybody. Yeah, okay. I get it. For us, it's not too early. And the reason why is because Christmas around here is a really, really big deal. Uh, it is, and it's not just because it is the birth of Jesus that we celebrate. Yes, that is what makes Christmas significant, and yes, that is why we celebrate. But something really special happens at Christmas time that I, is just unique to what I believe God is doing in the hearts and lives of people. And it's this, people who for every other reason on the planet wouldn't come to church, don't want to come to church, have closed themselves off to the conversation, to the exploration of any of those types of things, find themselves saying, I'd like to come to a church service. And we find people attending here and stepping into our services here that just, when you ask, you're like, what brought you here? They're like, I don't know. I just, I wanted to find a church service. Have you been here before? No, I've never been here before. Well, it's good to have you. And you just recognize like there, there's all of these people that God is working in and moving in that take a pretty significant step on Christmas. And oftentimes that's the first time they attend. And, and for many of them, they don't attend for like another year afterwards. But if you ask them, well, hey, it's your first Sunday when you first you know, see them back. And you're like, when was your first day? Christmas. Christmas Eve, it's this moment that created a kind of trust that when they needed a church to turn to, they had one, and they began coming to a place. And it just becomes a very powerful thing 
friends. I, and, and that's why we take advantage, that's why we take advantage of this. That's why we, we do such a big uh, service and all the things. That's why we ask all of you to be a part of hosting because it's not just a service, it's a church and we want people to experience the goodness of a church where there's acceptance and love and freedom in Christ because that is who we all are. I was, I was talking with a guy uh, just a little bit ago uh, in my office. He made an appointment to meet with me. I never talked with him before and he came in and sat down and as he's talking, I realized he'd been to a lot of churches along the way throughout his life and then at one point in time, he just let go of it altogether. And he said, I want nothing to do with this. And he, he did for years, did not come to a church of any kind. And then on Christmas Eve, he decided to show up here for some reason. I said, why did you come? He goes, I don't know. I just felt like I needed to that year. I wanted to. It's like a spark of hope or something. And so we attended Christmas service here, and he said, and I liked it, and I liked the people, and it seemed like you guys actually love and care about people, and that, that was a big deal. And I said, did you come back the next week? He said, no, he came back like six months later. And when he came back six months later, he began to talk to you all and, and interact with you all. And there was something about his interaction with you that made him set a meeting with me. And I said, what was it? And he, he tells me, he goes, all these people keep talking to me about like acceptance and love and freedom. And everybody's treating me like that, that stuff's actually true. But I have had a lot of experiences with churches along the way. And I needed to meet with you to hear whether or not, like I just needed to test it. <laughs> like I needed to see, is this really true? And I said, well, welcome home. You were accepted, you are loved and you are free. And you have a place in the kingdom of God. I'm so glad that you are here. And he started started to cry and he looked at me and he said, I have been to so many churches, but I think I'm finally finding Jesus Christ. It is. Not because of me, because something powerful happens when people interact with, with other people who have the acceptance and love and freedom in Jesus and extend that to people. Friends, that's the heart of the Christmas service. We're gonna have a great Christmas service. We're gonna talk about the birth of Christ and we're gonna have things for friends and family. But the heart of this whole thing is that we'd find moments and opportunities where people who would set foot into church would be able to do so in a way that they realize the heart of the mission of this church and the heart of Jesus for them, see? So I, I just wanna challenge you all to know in the back of your heads, that's what this is. But also be in prayer right now just for that service and for that season as it's approaching. And, and also be praying about who you might invite. Who's the person that might have an opportunity to be in the seat next to you because you've prepared a space for them and said, man, I, I'd love, if you don't have a place to go, I'd love for you to come. I just would love for you to be in prayer about that. And if God brings somebody to mind, take the step and invite. And that'd be a really significant thing. And just know as we all get involved and we all host as so many of us do every single year, that it is a good and beautiful thing. I love partnering with the work that God's already doing in people. It's significant, isn't it? In fact, can I just say, I'm so proud. And I, I know it sounds like I'm like a dad, but I, I mean that. Like, I, well, I am a dad, but not for you. <laughs> But I am, I'm so proud. Like there's a part of me that wells up with pride just to be a part of this community with you all. You are loving people in an extraordinary way. And I just, I, do you realize how unique your voice is right now? Do you realize that? That's what that gentleman was trying to express. He's like, I've been to church after church after church and there's something about my interaction with this group of people that I finally found something significant. I've encountered who I think Jesus really is. This is what he'd been looking for for a long time, friends. It's powerful. You're doing something so precious. Don't stop. Hold on to that. It is needed in our society. It's needed in our culture. It's needed in this place. It's needed in the lives of human beings right here and right now. And I just want to say I'm so appreciative of the many of you that sustain this place called Casas because you're a part of it. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this larger movement. And I just want to say keep going. For those of you that give, keep going. For those of you that maybe haven't given financially, I would like challenge you to do so. We're in the month of December. Or we're not, sorry. We're thinking about the month of December. <laughs> talking about Christmas. December is one of the most critical months uh, for, for churches, for us in particular. I, and it's just because of how it's just culture sets it up, or I don't know. But most of what becomes our church's budget, the most significant portion of what becomes our church's budget for the entire year happens in December. And that's what enables us to look into January and make all kinds of plans for the ministry year and things to come. And so we started this campaign uh, called a Make a Difference campaign uh, that's just about your end giving. And so if you're a person who gives for tax purposes at that time of the year, I wanna ask you to consider being a part of this and to take a step with us. And if you're a person who just says, I love this church, I love the mission of this church and I'm in, I want you to consider taking part in this. We've tried to make it as easy as possible for you 
you guys, uh, for all of us actually. And so they've changed the giving page on the website to just make it really easy if you go to that. Or if you wanna take a step even now, there's a giant QR code on the screen that you can do that with there that'll take you where you need to go and make it easy for you there too. But here's the purpose and the desire behind all of it. Besides just let's make great plans. I think God is doing something so incredible and so unique through all of you. I think this voice matters. And I think the unique heart that you all are bringing into ministry, into outreach, into all of this is a gift. And I'm excited to see what God's going to continue to do ahead of us in the year to come. Let me pray. God, I love you. We love you. We thank you that we get to just be Casas. We thank you for the way that you've you knit our hearts together. We thank you that this mission is, is not just words on a paper, but alive in us and through us. And I thank you that you're reaching people who need it. Lord, use us. Open our eyes, open our hearts, Lord, for whatever it is that you have ahead of us. And I just pray wisdom and guidance over resources through this church that we might step wisely, boldly, confidently into the things that you have in front of us in the year to come. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's uh, good to see you all here. So uh, I'm going to be wrapping up our series called The Dance. And uh, we've actually extended it a week. Uh, and uh, that's just because there's just more material, material than what we could uh, get through in all of this. And of course, the, just the whole idea of it is uh, relationships are like a dance, right? There's this dynamic of relating uh, that constantly goes on uh, between you and someone else. And we've looked at everything from family to friends. Last week we looked at romantic relationships. And I really want to pick up and kind of do part two on romantic relationships. Because last week we, we looked at this whole idea how like there's just moments where um, you can just miss each other. Um, and, and how do you come back together? But what I wanted to come back to, because it's just important to me, because I think there's a couple of ways that we end up missing each other uh, because we get caught in a particular kind of dance, in particular with romantic relationships. And I just want to be able to spend the, the right amount of time to kind of talk about these two different dances and their dynamics and what we can do to maybe change that uh, dance. Because we've built this whole series off the idea that if you change your dynamic, you just might change the whole dance, right? And so, these two dances. So I'm going to just dive right in here. And we're just going to talk about two things this morning. These two dances. So here's the first one. Um, the first one, I'm just going to call it, it's not me, it's you, right? It's a beautiful little ditty, right? It's a wonderful little dance uh, that uh, we get caught in all of the time. It's not me, it's uh, you. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, in, it's just honest, but also, you know, a little revealing and embarrassing. I, like, Angie and I got caught in this dance here just like a couple nights ago. Um, I had gotten home, and it was later, and I'd been in meetings, and it's just kind of a long day. And our small group uh, has been trying to plan when we were going to get together kind of for our, uh, like, Christmas get-together. And we've been in this small group for a long time, love everyone in it. And we had, had worked on a few dates, and those didn't work, and we were trying to settle these dates. And so I come in, and I sit down, and uh, Angie immediately asks me about, like, okay, that, I gave you another date to maybe think about, like, can you do that date? And I'm thinking, like, I already told you that, like, I could do whatever that date is. I told you I could do that date. And she's like, okay, um, no, you didn't because the, that one couldn't happen. And so now there's this other one and I need to ask you about this. And because we're trying to get this all together. And I'm like, no, I think you did ask me about this. And I did answer it. And, like, and we started this little thing about like, like, no, it's not me, it's you. See, you just don't remember that you'd already asked me about this and I told you about this because I know I'm right about this, right? And of course, you know, she's like, oh, you are right. No, she's like, um, 
No, see, you've been putting this off, and, da, 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 and we just and we got into this little dynamic, this little dance of, uh, no, it's not me, it's you. And it's like there's this problem, this issue that we're trying uh, to, to walk through, and we get pulled into this. In, anyone, like, does this sound familiar to anyone in here? Whether you're, you know, dating, right, or have been married a long time, or you're a newlywed, um, and you can get into this dance on any kind of issue, can't you? Right? Like, uh, you know, it can be with the schedule, and you can just think, you know what, if, if you would just get, you know, your time management pulled together, if you would just pay attention to your schedule, that would solve this problem, and things would be so much better. Um, you can do this with finances, right? Like, you know what, if you just had a little better financial, you know, management, or just made better decisions about it, like, it would solve the problem, and it'd be so much better. Or, you know, there's the flip side of that, and it's just like, you know, if you'd learn how to just live a little bit, life's not about money, it's about living, you know, and it's just, that would solve our problem on this thing. You can do this about raising kids. Right? Ever have a moment where you got into this dance and it's just like, no, this is how we should handle this situation with kids. No, this is how we should. And you get into this thing. Um, it can be about how clean the apartment should or shouldn't be. It like it's endless. And then it gets into this thing where it's about who's right and who's uh, wrong. And if you're like Angie and I, uh, we can take it to the next level, right? You don't have to just stay with that dance. Um, so, like, uh, I can, I, I have this wonderful dance ability that I can go from, you know, it's not me, it's you, and that means that you're probably the problem, and if you're the problem, I'm a problem fixer. So let me help you understand how you can fix this. And then I can, you know, be real corrective and give her great instructions and stuff, which, you know, can you picture how romantic that is? Yeah, right. Um, or Angie, like if Angie was standing here right now, uh, she would probably say, and I, I can get into that, and, and she'd say, I can go into the double down, right? Just keep at this thing. Or just step back and retreat a little bit, right? And just like, just let you in this, but I'm like, I'll disengage uh, in this whole thing. And we do this, and we find that we get pulled into these things, and it can be kind of a spiral. But at the end of the day, right, what this dance does is it just moves us apart, right? How many of you can remember a moment where, uh, whether, again, whether it, it's just any romantic relationship, and this applies to more than just romantic relationships, but think of a romantic relationship where suddenly there was an issue and you got pulled into this, it's not me, you kind of dance, and then on the other side of it, you just felt like, that made us so close. <laughs> Probably not, right? It's just like, ugh, right? But here's part of why it pushes us apart. It, it just invites us to start seeing the other person as the problem. And a problem that needs to be fixed or a problem that needs to be managed. And you know, if you, have, if you are in a long, long-term uh, romantic relationship, like some of you, you've been married for decades and decades and decades, like you have figured something out. And I really mean this. Um, there's a point to all of this that you already know that you have experienced and learned. Um, and it's not to say that uh, the longevity of your relationship is because you have learned how to solve all the issues that you disagree with, right? You're going, like, some of you are just like, <laughs> no, right? What you have learned is how to partner together through those issues, even if you never solve them, right? Because there's this thing that can happen with this dance where we begin to see the other person as the problem. And I know for some of you, um, you're like, man, there's an issue that is landed in our relationship and it is the only thing that we talk about and it creates the tension and it's this, and as I've brought this up, you can just feel the tension and it's just like, where do we go from here? I want to start with this. I want to start with this. We're, we're going to be looking at a passage in Matthew 7 uh, for this one, but I want to start with this because there is a question that I think becomes really important 
uh, for us to ask. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to word this question in the first uh, person in this. And here's the question I want you to ask. It's this. Do I want to dance with a partner or a problem? Right? When you think about this whole relational concept of the dance, it's ask yourself. Right? When you feel yourself being pulled into this kind of conversation, you feel the tension, you're arguing over the schedule and who's right or who's wrong about, you know, you know, what day on the calendar we said we were going to do what, or, you know, how we're going to clean the house or whatever it is, ask yourself this question. Do I want to dance with a problem or my partner? And if you want to dance with your partner, um, I want to, I want to suggest a way to maybe navigate away from that kind of dance into something else. And I want to look at something that Jesus teaches in uh, Matthew chapter 7. And the reason I want to go there, and if you, if you want to turn there now, you can, is because when we get caught in this dance, it's not me, it's you. At the core, the kind of the core operating mode of that dance is you're making judgments. It, you're, you're making judgments about that other person, and it becomes this series of judgments that's, that's going on because there's a problem, and we always have a judgment about a problem in there. And so I want us to look at what Jesus says here. And what, and what Jesus is teaching in this passage reaches so much further than just the scope of what I want to talk about this morning. But I want to keep it to the scope of this morning. I want to keep it on this relational piece of how to get out of this dance where we're kind of blaming the other and we're trying to prove who's right and who's wrong on this thing. So, Matthew chapter 7, starting with verse 1. Look at what he says. He says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, pause there for a second. Let me just say, what Jesus is not saying in this moment is that, you know, God is up in heaven and he's watching how you judge other people and he's just waiting to judge you back in the same exact way. That's not the point here. What Jesus is talking about here is uh, very clearly a relational context. And uh, think about what he's teaching because this is uh, incredibly insightful. Um, when we see someone else as a problem, right, we start to judge them. That just... You're a problem, and I've got judgments as to why you're a problem. What happens when some, like think of a romantic relationship. They know when we're judging. It gets hard to hide. What do we invite back when we judge someone? More judgment, right? We, like it's exactly what Jesus is saying here. And, and when we feel judged by them because we judge them, what are we going to do? We're going to judge them back, and then they're going to judge. It just, right, it turns into that loop in all of this. And so he goes on here, and he says some things that, that, that we'll, we'll break down for a moment here. But look at verse 3. He says this. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Um, and so, he, like, he points out a couple of things here um, that actually invite us to relate different, to build a, a different kind of dance with our partner, with our friend, with our date, with our spouse, right? We're talking about some of the most important people in our lives uh, in this. So a couple of things, or, or one thing, and then I, I want to unfold it a little bit. Um, uh, first of all, think about what Jesus is saying when he's saying um, th there's a plank in your eye, right? And, and he's exaggerating this. He's, he's using this figurative language to point at this thing of like, so it, it's like, you don't even see the plank in your own eye. Like, there's a little bit of self-awareness that's an issue in this moment. That's what he's pointing out in this, right? And, and that lack of awareness is going to have a negative impact relationally in this. So here's, here's the first point. And, and, I'm gonna, and again, I'm going to put this in the form of a question. Um, and this is the question to ask. What's my dynamic? What's my dynamic? What, what's in my eye right now? And, and as you begin to look at that, 
like there's a part of it that suddenly it's like, okay, uh, maybe I'm playing a role in this. Maybe when I'm in this discussion with Angie and she's so wrong about understanding how, you know, uh, who has said what about their availability on the calendar and she's just, she's not remembering this correctly and we're in this discussion and I'm like, why is this going to a negative place? Maybe Glenn needs to go, maybe I'm a part of where this is going. Maybe there's a dynamic that I hold in this. And if I'm sitting there unaware, it just, like, part of me wants to just go like, like, like Angie's got the problem with this. I'll, I'll clear it up for her in this moment, right? And she'll be so grateful that I've done that, right? So it starts with this thing of like, what's my dynamic? And, and let me suggest this. If you find yourself in a moment and there is that person that you love and you feel the tension coming and maybe it's like, man, I feel like he or she's saying, I'm in the wrong. Well, I, like, and I just instantly can think of like five reasons why they're wrong in this. And all of a sudden you're just like, oh, wait a minute. I, I'm in that dance. And you ask yourself the question, do I want to dance with a problem or my partner? But the emotion of it, right? That's the, we, we feel that. Here's, he, he, let me suggest this. In that moment, if you have to, close your eyes. Like if you need to say, you know, I love you, but I don't want to look at you right now because you're reminding me, right? you're pulling me in the wrong direction. You know, like, um, close your eyes. Pause for a second. And pray, right? right? And, and literally ask. Just say, Jesus, you live in me. Help me see what I need to see in this moment. What, what's, the, what's the speck or maybe the plank that I'm missing in this moment? Help me to see this. And, and, I, and I really mean this. To take a moment in your relationship with Christ and say, help me relate better. Help me understand what I don't see in this moment. Um, do that and now... Here's, here's how I want to invite you to play this out. And this is going to feel, this is going to take a little bit of courage. But, I, but be courageous in this. Um, I want you to share some of what you learned about yourself with that person that you love. With your husband, your wife, right? Your fiance, the person that you're dating. Because it takes a little bit of a, a, of a vulnerability in that moment. But being able to share that in that moment, that is, a, that is a change of dynamic. Do you see how that is so different than the normal dance step of, uh, it's not me, it's you, right? Um, it's interesting. So Angie and I had that conversation a couple of nights ago. Didn't go really well, okay? Yesterday, we actually circled back around to that conversation. And part of it, it was like, I was like, I'm working on this message and like, you know, I, I'm kind of preaching to myself here as I'm working on this thing. And I went and Angie and I actually had a discussion um, about that. And it was interesting as we talked about it, we both, like, we, there were things that we both knew and there was something about sharing that with the other that was powerful. Um, there was a moment where I, I told her, I said, you know, if I could go back, y y you know what I know about me? I walked into the house frustrated. It was just a long day and it was lots of meetings and I'm not a meeting kind of person and I just walked in there and I just didn't want to deal with anything, especially anything that meant that I'd have to open up my computer in that moment. And I was frustrated. And I told her, I said, I kind of see that now. If I could do it over, I wouldn't put my frustration on you. You were just trying to ask a question to clarify something, and I, like, I didn't want to do that. And if uh, Angie were here right now, I think what she would share is, you know, she was like, you know, you walked in the door, and I was feeling all this pressure because the date had changed and everybody could meet on this date and we couldn't meet on that date. And so they were trying to find this. And I felt the pressure to try and find that time, find that date. And you walked in the door and I'm, and I'm feeling all that. And I started putting that pressure on you. And, and I, and she's, always, she's like, I, I saw that you were frustrated. 
And if I could do it over again, I think I would have backed off and not put that pressure on you in that moment. And, and just, I, she's like, I could have done that with more care. And friends, there's nothing magical about all of that, right? There's not any you know, major uh, points or systems that you have to memorize in all of that. It's just, God, help me be aware. What's the dynamic that I'm missing with me, what I need to know? And as I understand that a little bit better, I'm in a relationship with what is probably one of the most important people in my life. And if I can just take a little step, albeit a little courageous, of some vulnerability and let them know where I'm at, I'm trusting that that dynamic will change in a way. And, and you know, I'm gonna add this. I added this in the last service, not in my notes. If that person in your life shows you a moment of vulnerability, treat that like gold. When that person, right, who, Angie, she's my favorite person in the world. You wouldn't always know it, right, because I can, I can fight and argue with her, and isn't this the way romantic relationships work sometimes? That's the person we can get in the, in the deepest, most frustrating arguments with, but the truth is, she's my favorite person. I love her more than anyone in this world. And if she's willing to be vulnerable with me, treating, like, treating that moment like gold, that, right? We didn't solve the calendar problem totally, right? But you know what? We didn't need to. We didn't need to because one of us changed the dynamic and the other changed the dynamic. And before we knew it, we were changing the whole dance. Try it, try it. So. One more dance, one more dance, and, and right? Just two things this morning, right? Do you think I could do this in 15 minutes? No. Um, uh, one more dance, and I'm gonna just call this dance this. This is dancing with my enemy, right? Just that's, uh, that's what I'm gonna call this one, right? And this is, this is the dance that we get pulled into when, when something happens and we feel a little hurt or we feel like we've got to armor up or we've got to be on guard, right? There's, it's, it's a little bit like, uh, it's, it's, your partner feels a little bit more like an opponent, right? There's some, I've got to overcome whatever they're doing in this moment. I, like, that's why you feel on guard. Maybe you've had a moment like where you're just like, my, I feel like my spouse is trying to control me or belittle me in this moment. And it just, man, that, it, that, it just, it, it leaves you spinning uh, in a moment. Or there's a boyfriend or girlfriend and you're just like, they can be so defensive um, and, or blindside me with like a cutting remark. And, and now I'm like always kind of on eggshells as to like, is something gonna happen? And that cutting remark is, is gonna come back or maybe on the milder side, it's just like, you know, I feel like if I don't stand up for myself, I'm gonna get run over in this moment. And so I just want to pull back here. And when we get into that kind of like dancing with my enemy, we find that we start doing these subtle things that are all about protecting ourselves or like a counter attack. And what we're actually learning in those moments, we're learning how to not care. We're learning how to get thick skinned and, and not be impacted by what they feel, what they're going through, because that's how we protect ourselves. But the end result of that, friends, is that it creates a dynamic that fosters a sense of contempt in your relationship. And when I say contempt, contempt is when we start lowering and lowering how we see the other person, even as a human being, right? It's, it's just, uh, contempt has us in the place where it's just like, I don't even need to consider what you're saying. Like, it's just, it's just uh, um, I don't need to worry about what you're feeling in this. Like, it's just, right, that's contempt. But here's the thing. Contempt is what we reserve for how to deal with our enemies emotionally. And that's why contempt in a romantic relationship is, is a killer. In fact, um, uh, there's a couple of authors, husband and wife, the Gottmans, 
that have done decades of some of the best research on marriage that has ever been done. They've written a couple of books, and I can't think of the books off the top of my head, but if ever you wanted a book on marriage, uh, the Gottmans uh, would be uh, one of the number one books uh, that you could uh, go with. Um, but one of the things that they have found, and they've done all of this uh, research, technical research, and it's not that they have, uh, you know, can work magic. Uh, it's, it's that they have this deep understanding of the dynamics going on in, in, in what I'll argue is the most romantic of all relationships is, is between, you know, is a, is a marriage relationship between a husband and a wife. And there's this dynamic that they can see usually within 10 or 15 minutes and with about 88% accuracy can predict whether or not that couple will still be married in four or five years. And one of the number one things they speak of, that what they see that they know a marriage will not last, is if there's any kind of contempt. Because it, it just, it's a, it, it kills a relationship in this. Um, and the thing is with that, it's, that's where we start, when we get into that dancing, like my partner is my opponent or my enemy, that's where we start, without realizing it, pulling in a sense of contempt within, it, within our relationship. So here's the question that I want you to ask, right? If you feel that coming, if you feel that I'm always armoring up, and you know, we're always going to be pulled into that. It's, it's when it starts becoming the norm, when it starts becoming a way. Here, here's the question I want you to ask. Right? Do I want to dance with my enemy or my partner? Right? When you see that coming, don't ignore it. And just ask yourself, do I want to dance with my enemy or my partner? So how do you get out of that? Because we all get pulled into it. Let me give you another story of Angie and I, where we, we were getting pulled into this uh, dynamic. Um, Several weeks ago, I shared with you that this past summer was a little chaotic for us because there was a water leak that we had and uh, a short little repair turned into us not being able to live in our home for four months. And so we moved back in, right? But the chaos continued because the movers didn't have all of our stuff. They moved in some stuff that wasn't our stuff. And so we're going through all these boxes trying to figure out, is this our stuff, not our stuff? What stuff of ours isn't here? And you can imagine the chaos and just the frustration and trying to navigate all of that. And there was, um, there might have been a time where, where I was bringing in some extra boxes, boxes that the movers weren't bringing in that, that just... There was just some stuff I wanted to go through, and I had these extra boxes, and I was pulling them in there. And uh, Angie was just like, why, why, why are you bringing more boxes? Like, we're living, we're walking through little tunnels of boxes in our house right now. And it was a, it was a bit of an aggravation, and I kind of pushed back on that, and just it became a point of, of contention. And then there was one afternoon, we're standing in the kitchen, and Angie, we had talked about those boxes for a while, and she brought them up again, and I was a little frustrated, but I was, I was even extra frustrated because... There were some boxes in, in the dining room just off to the other side over here, piled up on top of our dining room table, and those were her boxes. Notice, I've already assigned, they're you know, my boxes, but there are her boxes too, right? And this was stuff that could have been put away or put up on the walls, but she was like wanting to sort things. She's like, you know, this is a great time to get rid of stuff that we don't need. And so instead of putting it all back up and then taking stuff down, like I'm going to kind of go through all of this. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I've got my boxes. She, she's got her boxes and she's asking about these. And I was, and by this time, like, and, and I was just, it was, you know, like, it's just like, why are you attacking me over my boxes? You know, that's a, and I just, out of the corner of my eye, I could see those boxes on the table and I wanted to go there, right? And, but I held off for a little bit, right? But there was this dynamic in this and it's like, she's going to come after me for my boxes and like, how am I going to defend myself? Maybe I could go, like, I could blame her for her boxes. I could do that. Or I could talk about, you know, like how my boxes, like there's really important stuff in my, like just this is where my brain is going. And this is that kind of dancing with my enemy. How am I going to out strategize you in this moment? And we get pulled into these moments, right? Now, I want to go back 
to something that Jesus teaches. In fact, it's in the same, this is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I want to look at something he says earlier. It's in chapter 5 because there's something he says here. And again, Jesus is pointing to something uh, broader than just how we're applying it this morning. But there is something he teaches here that is really valuable for us to understand that will help us when we get pulled into this dancing with my enemy kind of dance uh, here. Um, so uh, look at Matthew chapter 5. Uh, here's, here's what he says, starting in verse, 20, uh, verse 21. He says, uh, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder. So, you know, at a very low level, there's that right there. Just don't kill your spouse in that moment, right? But he goes on. There's deeper stuff that he's got here. He says, um, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. Verse 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, uh, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. And you're just like, whoa, Jesus is getting really intense with this. But here, here's what I, I, I just, there's so much here, but I, I just, I want us to look at this one thing here. It's interesting, right? And again, he's talking about relationship here. And he talks about anyone who says to a brother or sister, or we could say a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, fiance, right? Raka. And here's what I want you to know about this little word, raka. It's actually not a Greek word, which most of the New Testament's written in. It's actually an Aramaic word. Um, and it was an Aramaic word that was used. It, it, is, it is what you call that person that you held in contempt. It is a contemptuous word. To say raka, that, that, that was, that's a word you reserved in response for the person you held in contempt. And what Jesus is saying here is, okay, you know that person, not your enemy, your brother, your sister, right? Your spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, the, the person... That, that you love, that, that you have dreams about the relationship you're going to build. And you, and there's, you have contempt, right? There's that thing where you're just like, oh, right? That's, that's the place here. And he goes on and, and he says this. Look at verse 23. He says, right? There's, he says, therefore... If you are offering your gift at the altar, and, this, and he's going to go through this kind of answer, where to take this. If you're offering uh, your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Because here's the thing. When we think of someone um, that, that we kind of hold in contempt over something, there, we can wait on that. We could, like, we, I don't, like, we don't need to pay them any mind. We, right, contempt is what we reserve for our enemies. I don't have to consider you with care or concern or understanding the way I would most human beings. It's a defense mechanism. And what he's saying is, I want you to do the opposite. See, he's contrasting Raka with reconciled. And I love how he builds this out. He's like, you may think there's something more important, right? For crying out loud, it's your gift for God, right? You're on the, you've got your gift for God and you're going to the altar. What could be more important than that? And what I love about this, what Jesus is saying is, you know what? God looks at that and goes, you know what? You can give me that gift later. But if you're at a place of contempt with that, person, that special person, you know, like, you've got to find a way to move toward them. And let me say this. I, I just, I feel like I need to say this. If right now you're like, Glenn, I'm hurting a little bit, or I, like, I, I don't know what to do, because as you talk about this particular dance, and you talk about, like, this is maybe one of the most dangerous dances we get into, and you're like, I see my own relationship in this. I notice I armor up way too often with, with that person in my life, right? 
my husband, my wife, I, like, I'm thinking about that counterattack. I, like, there's, and, and I do, there are things where I just, I don't even want to consider them, or I feel that from them, and you, and you're at this point right now where you're just like, it's hard for me to even hear anything else you're saying right now. First, I want to just say, I'm sorry. I, I mean that. But I also want to say, um, there's hope. That's the beauty of, of what Jesus is saying here, is that there's always a moment to change your dynamic, even when, when raka is what's on your tongue. You get to change a dynamic and move towards reconciliation. Because sometimes, not always, right, there's no guarantees here, but sometimes you change your dynamic, and it can change the whole dance. There, there's... There's a way to step forward and change the dance. And sometimes we just don't know how. Sometimes we just don't identify it. And what I think Jesus points out in this moment here is like the, the, just take, change the dance and take a dance step towards reconciliation in this moment. So can I just, I want to offer a few things about how to change that dance uh, step here away from, right, away from, um, the dance of, I'm dancing with my enemy, right? Um, and it's this. Here, here, here's the first thing. Um, go back to that question I asked. Who do you want to dance with? Who do you want to dance with? And the reason I say this, I think this is important, because you realize your relationship didn't start in this place. No one starts a, a, a romantic relationship. No one says, you know, you know that you know, there's that person, I, I just struggle with contempt over them. I wonder if they would go on a date with me, right? Just, you don't start in that place. We start at a place, right? We enter a romantic relationship because there's something about them we just say, I'm kind of attracted to them. I'm kind of smitten with them. I want to get to know them better. We're drawn to them. And I promise you, there's something there. There was something you saw. Maybe as you, right, maybe there, it started with physical attraction and then it went to something. There's something I like about who they are. I like their outlook on life. They're, you know, they're kind of different than me and I, and I love how they're different. It frustrates me a little bit, but, they, but it also excites me a little bit and, and I see it's good for me. I promise you, if you're in a romantic relationship, and, and again, whether you've been dating for a while, or whether, you know, you're married, um, th there was something, there was something of a bedrock that, that attracted to you, uh, to them in the first place. And to ask this question, I think helps you get back to that place. Because the person you want to dance with is the person that you were drawn back to way back then. Go back to that. And if you're saying, I want to dance with that person, Get, get back to that, see. You know, it's interesting. Stand, both of us are standing there in the, in the kitchen, right? And she's pointing at my boxes because she's fed up with those boxes. And we've had discussions about this. And I've been defensive over, you know, my boxes and this whole thing. And in this moment, right, is it, I could just see it. I could just see, uh, like, I'm ar armoring up. And I can see that she's going to do it. And I, and I know my next tactic. And it's, right, it's just like she's walked into this, right? My boxes, look at all those boxes over there. And I remember this moment where I could, I knew I was looking at her as my opponent. And I remember just thinking in my own heart and mind, I don't want to look at her as my opponent. I didn't know what else to do in that moment, but just... I took a step back, not a step back to retreat or to be defensive. I took a step back and just paused because I knew I, there was just something more that I needed to see. And sometimes, great, because I want to see her as more than just my opponent in this moment. I don't, I could just, we've been married so long and it's just like, I know where we can take this this discussion. And it, you know, we can make this into the thing that just be miserable for both of us in this and still not solve it. And I took a step back in that moment. And I loved what she did next, okay? Um, because this, here's kind of the second thing in this that I'll say. When you take a step back, when you think about who you really wanna dance with, 
I want to encourage you to tell them something about it. I want you to tell them what you want them to know that will actually help bring you closer together. Here's what Angie did. I'm sitting there, I am so frustrated. I want to, I, like, you know, I can still see those boxes out of the corner of my eye and I'm standing there, you know, just like a deer in the headlights. And Angie goes, you're probably thinking about all those boxes in there that are mine and want to bring those up, don't you? I was like, on the inside, I was like, yes, I do, right? But I was like, I probably shouldn't go there because this is kind of a vulnerable moment. And, you know, but that moment of vulnerability, she's just like, I know, I've got my boxes, right? And all of a sudden, it like, I got past my moment of like, yeah, you recognize that I see that. But now, now, now I'm seeing you a little different in this moment, right? And she went on to then tell me, she said, I, I know, and I, the, you're, the, what you, I don't, it frustrates me so much that with all the chaos, you just brought more boxes and it's chaos. And I know you probably wish I did something different with those because it brought more chaos in, in this. She goes, but the thing is, I thought I was gonna get all of that done and figured out and out of the way and all this other stuff and I couldn't. She got pulled into uh, her work and office late on a bunch of stuff. And she said, I've been feeling guilty about that. And I just know in this moment that we'll get into this conversation and that you have all the right in the world to point that out and all of this stuff because what I've said, but I know that will make me feel so guilty and I just don't want to feel guilty. And when the love of my life said, I just don't want to feel guilty, she invited something in me that was a, such a different dance. Because in that moment, I thought of her as the love of my life. And I said to her, and this came natural. See, that first steps where I had to, I was fighting it to not get into that dance. But when she responded in that way, my response was, I don't want you to feel guilty either. Like, let, we, we can put the boxes aside right now. And all of a sudden, everything started to change. You know what didn't change? Here's the last lesson in this whole thing, and I promise, and I'll quit crying. And just, okay, here's I wasn't planning on it. We didn't fix the box thing. She was still frustrating me about those boxes, and I, it took me a while to get through all my boxes. I don't know how long it took, and same with her, right? Just, just we, we couldn't figure out a good solution for those things because we, we each wanted it our way, and we each had something that was important to us that wasn't important to the other person, but it just didn't matter. I can't even remember when, we, when the boxes went away because somehow we found a way to dance with our partner in this. And the issue that wanted to make us enemies couldn't. And it just faded away. And sometimes when you find that beautiful way to dance with your partner, you'll solve some of your issues and other issues you won't solve. But what you will do is you, you will find a way to come together and be connected. And that, that's the thing we long for, friends, isn't it? So let me just end the whole series with this. Change your dynamic and you might just change the whole dance in your family or with your friends or in your marriage or the person you're engaged to or the person you're dating change the dance. So before we close, let me just say this, right? If you're here this morning and you're brand new, you're visiting, or we've maybe you've been here for a little while, we've never had a chance to meet. I'd love to meet. I'm going to be right over here uh, by uh, that uh, high top table over there. I'd love to just shake your hand, welcome you this morning. If you want someone to pray for you, we've got some wonderful people in our prayer uh, place that would love to pray for you. And just know we have like 18 more families that we want to sponsor through Gifts of Love. So if you want to do that or you've got questions about that, just right over here, uh, make your way over there and uh, they can answer your questions and take care of that. Why don't you stand? And I'm gonna close this out uh, this morning. L let me pray. Father, um, as we end this series about the dance and relationships, I ju we just pray that you would just fill our hearts, that you would guide, that your spirit would just be in and with all of our re relationships. Help us 
to relate in some of the beautiful, wonderful ways that you've actually created us to do. And may you be central in all of our relationships. And Father, we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Have a great morning. We'll see you next week. Telling stories